From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. At the legislature today, Twitter and Facebook have made their way into the legislative process. Some members of the House of Delegates have taken to the social networking sites to bring transparency to their work. And you want to install solar panels on your home, but your homeowners association won't allow it. Tonight we'll discuss an effort to change that and look at other environmental issues on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Beth Voorhees. Under current state law, the Division of Motor Vehicles is required to suspend your driver's license if a court notifies it that you've been fined for anything. It could be for walking your dog without a leash, or that you haven't paid your fishing license, or any other violation that has nothing to do with operating your motor vehicle. This news came as surprise to one member of the Senate Transportation Committee today. Senator Doug Facemeyer of Braxton County quizzed Steve Dale, the deputy commissioner of the DMV, when he learned that the agency could suspend a driver's license without due process. Well, for one thing, you'd be driving while suspended or revoked, so that would, that would, be, the, that would be the primary charge. I haven't, been, I haven't been charged with that yet. If I haven't paid my three tickets, that doesn't automatically revoke my driver's license. Yes, it does. Without going before any due process? There is, you're, you're due, this, this, is part of, this is part of the problem that we're trying to resolve. Now, Currently, wait a minute. If I had my, and mm -hmm. Greg, you can help me here. I'm going to hire him to represent <laughs> me in this hearing right here with you. But anyway, if, if I've got these three tickets out, mm -hmm. I still have to go through due process before you can take my license. I'm not driving on suspended license till I go through my due process. Is that not correct? Well, at, at this point, if you have an unpaid ticket, let's say you have an unpaid ticket from Braxton County Magistrate Court. Braxton County Magistrate Court, under provisions of law, have notified DMV that you haven't paid your ticket. Under present law, we would be required to suspend your license, and we would send you notice by certified mail that, that your license had been suspended. This is what we're trying to approach with this legislation, is right now we're doing 70, 80, 90,000 of these unpaid tickets a year. So in effect, you are suspended and you would be in violation of 17B43. Providing I've gotten my registered letter. Well, it doesn't really matter if you've gotten your letter or not. We do have, indica we do have situations where people move and they don't notify us of their new address. Senate Bill 519 says that a majority of the suspension and revocation actions undertaken by the Division of Motor Vehicles are for non-driving related reasons, including the non-payment of citations and a variety of other non-safety related reasons. The bill allows any driver whose license has been suspended for these reasons to pay a $25 reimbursement fee to get their driving privileges restored. That's half the normal price of $50. The DMV wants the bill passed so people can get behind the wheel and drive to a job. Ten bills passed the Senate today, all unanimously and all without debate. Disarming or attempting to take a weapon away from a correctional officer would be a felony. Under the bill, Finance Chairman Senator Roman Prezioso explained. Senate Bill 166 makes it a felony to intentionally disarm or attempt to disarm a corrections officer. The penalty for this is uh, one to five years. Uh, this tra uh, change treats correctional officers, officers as other law enforcement officers such as probation officers and parole officers, urge the adoption of the bill. Senate Bill 186, Senate Bill 186 provides salary equity supplement payments to teachers and service personnel in order to achieve salary equity among the state's counties. But as Education Chairman Senator Robert Plymel explained, the bill doesn't actually pay anybody anything. This uh, bill just uh, clarifies and uh, puts into code what we have been doing in practice for many years. Actually, in 2001, the department, uh, an audit report of the legislative auditor recommended that the department request the legislature to include the supplemental state equity salary table and the corresponding calculation in code. This bill does place it in code and it's no additional money that uh, will need to be added to this. This is already in the uh, budget bill. 
Automated sales suppression devices on electronic cash registers are sometimes referred to as zappers or phantomware. Under Senate Bill 411, installing one of these devices would be illegal. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 411 would create a new offense of selling, possessing, installing, or trading an automated sales suppression device. These are devices that uh, attach to, can be attached to electronic cash registers to suppress sales. So I think our understanding is these are used sometimes by owners to hide sales and avoid taxes or could be used by employees to hide sales and take money. This bill would make the, those activities illegal, would create a felony with penalties of one to five years and a fine of $10,000 to $100,000, urge passage of the bill. And with so much information available online in this day and age, law libraries that are maintained by circuit courts around the state have become obsolete. So House Bill 4291 would allow them to be closed. House Bill 4291 deals with county law libraries. Current, under current law, the Supreme Court and circuit courts are authorized to establish these libraries. Uh, this bill would remove the authority of the circuit courts to establish them and would provide that the Supreme Court can make that determination. It's our understanding that there are a few of these libraries that are going virtually unused and, and they believe it's appropriate to, to close a couple of them down or it's a passage of the bill. The Senate made a slight adjustment to the title of House Bill 4291, so it has to go back to the House for its approval. Members of the general public can access how delegates vote through the West Virginia Legislature's website. But as Adam Cavalier reports, some delegates are taking the concept of op open government to another level. Delegates are taking to Twitter and Facebook to tell their constituents how they're voting on every issue. Berkeley County Republican Jonathan Miller says he values the direct communication the social media platforms provide. If people are following you and have questions about uh, how you voted or, or about that bill, you can talk with them. And I think it's nice because it helps put greater pressure on the body as a whole and on politicians as a whole um, and the legislature as a whole to be more transparent, to do things and to, to go that extra step because we can do this voluntarily and we should also do, I think, you know, more as a body as well. As soon as he votes, Putnam County Republican Troy Andes posts his decision and the result to Twitter. Andes says he wants to make it easy for people to find out how he votes. When I first ran for the House of Delegates, it was nearly impossible to find out how incumbent members of the House were voting. You had to go online and it was a rather convoluted process to find roll call votes for incumbent members. So with the advent of Twitter, I decided, you know, as long as I'm here in the House chamber, I want my constituents to be able to see how I'm voting. Mineral County Republican Gary Howe primarily uses Facebook to send out his decisions. Howe says he actually got the idea to use social media for transparency from a constituent. One of them come up to me and uh, the other day and he said, hey, I was talking to somebody on the street and they said, did you know how Gary voted on such and such? They said, yeah, he told me. Uh, you know, it's like, there's no surprises to them. You know, they know exactly how I vote. And I get feedback uh, telling me, uh, you know, hey, you're doing the wrong thing, which is very rare. Uh, most of them just say, hey, it's great. Uh, we like your explanation, didn't think of it that way. Uh, you know, keep doing it. From computers to iPhones to iPads, it doesn't matter how delegates upload their votes. But Hal says he's just glad that legislators are putting their decisions out in the open. They get feedback almost instantly from me. I cast a vote, it ends up on Facebook, they know how I voted, and if I think it's going to be controversial, I put a brief description of why I voted the way I did. Now what I do is I go in ahead of time and I'll pull the bills out that will be voting on that day and I'll kind of put my post together and I said, okay, I'm going to explain why I voted this way. People are like it, that they can see how you're voting and it helps to, um, you know, be open with them, to let them know that you're not going to hide your vote, you're not going to try to hide behind things, you're going to, you know, whenever you go on record, you're going to publish it as best you can and let them see it. Um, and I let people know back home, because uh, I write columns also, and let them know that they can go on that site to see how I voted. Um, so it's, it's a very nice thing we can do without having um, at least some better website out there for people to see it. Because, you know, right now, they have to know the bill number and be able to access that and figure out how to do that. And that's, that's not too difficult, but it's a little, uh, little more, a few more steps involved than just going to the Twitter page or Facebook. I'm really grateful that others have stepped up. I think transparency is something that's lacking in this process, and social media helps us connect our constituents to the legislature. In a tweet to Delegate Doug Scaff, Andy's called the process of posting votes the Transparency Caucus. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, 
I'm Adam Cavalier in Charleston. In a moment, a review of environmental legislation. First, here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the Senate today and what's coming up in the Senate tomorrow. Among the bills introduced in the Senate today, Senate Bill 580 to allow an inmate upon release from custody to restructure child support payments under the jurisdiction of one judge. Senate Bill 581 to create the Provider-Sponsored Network Act and authorize the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Resources to recognize such networks. The bill assigns Medicaid beneficiaries to a provider-sponsored network. Senate Bill 582 to permit magistrate courts, like municipal courts, to collect unpaid costs, fines, forfeitures, and penalties be deducted from a defendant's income tax refund. Senate Bill 586 to raise the tobacco tax by $1 and dedicate half the proceeds to certain health-related issues and the other half to the General Revenue Fund. Senate Bill 589 to protect unborn children who are capable of experiencing pain by prohibiting abortion after 20 weeks post-fertilization, except when the mother has a medical emergency. Among the bills up for passage in the Senate tomorrow, Senate Bill 75, to create the Equine Rescue Facilities Act and require those facilities be licensed by the Commissioner of Agriculture. Senate Bill 164, to deter frivolous, malicious, or harassing lawsuits by prisoners under a life sentence. Senate Bill 379, to authorize the West Virginia Board of Examiners of Registered Professional Nurses to designate programs in which nurses may be monitored while they pursue treatment and recovery for alcohol abuse, chemical dependency, or major mental illness, and in which these persons may voluntarily enroll without being subject to disciplinary action if the person complies with the goals and restrictions of the program. Senate Bill 390, Governor Tomlin's bill to increase the funding amount from 13% to 15% for the Rainy Day Fund and dedicate a portion of the revenue to the state's Medicaid program and infrastructure modernization. And Senate Bill 408, providing for jail time for the intentional defacement of public or private property with graffiti. As a preface to our discussion about environmental issues at this session of the state legislature, a review of the environmental legislation approved at its most recent special session. West Virginia adopted new rules on Marcella shale gas drilling. It took several legislative sessions, but House and Senate members finally reached a compromise and sent a package to Governor Earl Ray Tomlin late last year. Beneduccio outlines this new law. The Horizontal Well Act mandates permitting fees of $10,000 for an initial gas well. Then drillers must pay $5,000 for additional wells at the site. The fee increases will help the Department of Environmental Protection hire more oil and gas well inspectors. About 15 new positions can be filled with this increased revenue. The bill also defines where wells can or cannot be located. New gas wells have to be 250 feet from existing water wells, 625 feet from houses, 100 feet from any water body or wetland, 300 feet from a trout stream, and 1,000 feet from a public water intake. There's also a public notice provision in the legislation. Public notice became a hot-button issue last May when gas drilling operations began just outside the city of Morgantown near a public water intake. The residents of Morgantown didn't know that wells were being sinked there until operations began. Now, a surface owner must know at least 72 hours before survey crews come in to look at the land. An operator must also obtain certification from the Division of Highways and reach an agreement to explain how secondary roads will be affected by the well work. The operator will have to maintain and repair those roads unless they can justify why they wouldn't have to. According to the Department of Environmental Protection, there are more than 55,000 oil and gas wells in the state, including Marcellus Shale gas wells. For West Virginia Public Broadcasting, I'm Beneduccio in Morgantown. Other bills pertaining to Marcellus Shale gas drilling have been introduced at this session, but lawmakers are reluctant to take up any new regulations until they see how the ones they passed are holding up. There are other environmental bills. Following them is John Christensen with the West Virginia Environmental Council. Welcome. So glad you're here. Thank you very much. Happy Valentine's Day. Well, thank you. And same to you and same to all of our viewers as well. So you are a solar energy advocate. 
Governmental Affairs with MTV Solar in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. What's this about homeowners associations not allowing solar panels to be installed on houses? Tell me about that. Well, um, Beth, it's not really a problem in West Virginia yet. Uh, we've had problems in other states, uh, namely Pennsylvania, and they're addressing that this session. Uh, we we want to have a, a degree of certainty going forward. Our company is growing rapidly and we're hiring more and more people. The industry is growing rapidly, uh, happy to say. Uh, over 100,000 people are working in the industry nationwide. Mm -hmm. And uh, so going forward, we're just putting a couple little bills out there to hopefully, you know, get people excited about solar and and make it easier for, for us to do the installs. And you want to make sure you can sell some solar panels. Well, exactly. And, and the big goal for us, for our company, is to attract a solar manufacturer to West Virginia and create even more jobs. And since we have all the raw materials here in the Mountain State, there's no reason why we can't make this happen. What kind of raw materials are here for solar panels? The silicon uh, required to make the, the actual solar cells. The glass, you know, we have a great glass industry to make the tempered glass, and of course the aluminum. So uh, those those are the three main components. Mm -hmm. How is it going for solar energy in West Virginia? It's fabulous. It really, it is. really is. Yeah, it's it's exceeded our expectations. Uh, the legislature has been very kind to us in passing good good legislation that will help us out economically to for our customers to be able to afford it and get a a, a reasonable payback in a short amount of time and it also helps the grid here in the state because most of our uh, systems are net metered installed to the grid mm -hmm. and uh, this helps the uh, electric companies handle the peak loads. How much does it cost to install I know, some sort of solar system on a big house? Well it, it, it varies and it's very modular so if somebody wanted to start out small and add to it over time they could do that um, but it's basically somewhere around six dollars a watt at this point. So a typical uh, you know, five kilowatt system would run about $30,000. But the payback is rather quickly. You get tax credits from the federal government, 30%. Plus, you know, we have some new incentives in West Virginia besides our four-year-old uh, $2,000 tax credit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the incentives are very good. And we're also promoting electric cars, electric vehicles, and the infrastructure to support that. So no homeowners associations right now are banning solar panels from any of their homes? Not that we know of. Okay. Um, and like I say, this is an idea that uh, we got from other states and other uh, very uh, progressive legislation to help us um, come further and not, re not face any obstacles. What other environmental legislation are you following? Well, the other uh, bill that we have, we have two solar bills. We have the, the Homeowners Association bill. We also have the um, tax relief bill for um, installing solar uh, that would reduce the, the amount of the system as far as the assessment for your property taxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have a couple of bills dealing with uh, energy, uh, least cost planning bill, uh, integrated resource planning. What does that mean? Least cost planning, integrated resources planning. What does that mean? Well, that has the power companies go ahead and project what their costs are going to be in, you know, 10 years out, 15 years out, with all the different, uh, you know, um, resources available for them to produce electricity, their costs, you know, their fixed costs, their distribution system costs. It's very complicated, but it, it's not something that they don't do in other states. And this is the, 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 the uh, reason we're pushing this is because they're already doing this in other states, and, and we think they should do it here, too. There's a bill banning coal slurry injection. That's into underground coal mines. There is a moratorium on that that the governor put on years ago. Yes, and it's still in effect, but we want to see a ban, uh, especially with these deep well injections uh, that are causing problems here in West Virginia and Prenter and Rawl. Mm -hmm. So this, this would address those. Mm -hmm. Senator... Richard Browning from Wyoming mm -hmm. County. He's uh, head of Senate Economic Development. And he was here talking about these coal slurry injection, mm -hmm. taking the coal slurry, turning it into a solid form, a brick, and putting those underground. Have you heard of that? Yeah, that's the dry method that we advocate. You do advocate that. Right. We, we think it should be dry. The, and there's no way that these things can reconstitute 
in a in a, a, a wet environment, a moist environment that can be a coal mine. Well, that that you know we'd have to look at that, but I know that's one of our um, solutions to the problem is a, a dry uh, mm -hmm. manufacturing process right. to, to process it in a dry fashion. All right. Is this an environmentally friendly legislature? It depends. Uh, normally we'd say uh, it's not just the legislature, it's also the, the leadership, you know, the mm -hmm. governor's mansion. We had worked out a, a pretty good bill uh, with the select committee on Marcellus. Uh, you know, we worked hard on that. There was many th thousands of hours of work went into that and the governor chose to um, replace it with his bill, which was much weaker. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, we looked at that. Mm -hmm. Where did his bill come from? If you had this bill worked out as a compromise, where did he get his information for his bill, you know? I have no way of knowing okay. uh, exactly, but uh, uh, the thought is that he had help from industry. Okay. You know? All right. Do you have any concerns about a cracker plant? Should one come to West Virginia? Well, it seems like there's a lot of interest uh, in economic development. That's one of my favorite committees, Browning's Committee. <laughs> we go there every week, and we were there today, and mm -hmm. uh, it's one of our favorite senators. Uh, but the whole cracker thing, uh, one of the main uh, products that they produce from this is glycol and uh, for automobiles and plastics. And, you know, we're, we're thinking that, you know, maybe plastics is on the way out in a lot of ways. Of course, certain things it'll never go out but plastic bags and stuff like that are, are things that we think we can avoid I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the end product's going to be but our, our thought is that you know it it can't be too good for the environment if they're going to be putting off a lot of emissions mm -hmm. and we just don't know what what that's going to be all right what so that impact you haven't uh, turned to other states environmental councils and other states uh, about this issue what they're facing what they're doing what they're trying to do and nothing like that well I, I wish I could say we have okay. uh, I know we've we've been on the computer looking for available information on Google and and there's very little information out there mm -hmm. do you agree that the legislature should not revisit regulations for Marcellus shale gas drilling until they've got some time to take a look at how the regulations are doing so far I understand the sentiment uh, because of all the work they put in, and I, and I, you know, congratulate all of them for all the time they put in. But there are certain provisions that were left out that we feel are very important. Like what? Uh, protecting homeowners, protecting surface owners, uh, mineral rights. There's, there's a lot of, of issues that could be strengthened, uh, we feel. And, uh, you know, we're, we're working hard, but we understand that the sentiment is not there uh, this year. But certainly it could be improved upon you know as soon as possible i know that one issue on your list that you're watching really has seemingly to me nothing to do with the environment excuse me and that's public financing for supreme court races right because we want to get money out of politics you know we we think that if if it was public finance for all levels uh that that would be better for the uh voters mm -hmm. to you know, make a decision based on the merits of the candidates mm. as opposed to how much money and how many ads they're running. And, you, and there's no disclosure of who those people are. I mean, we're, this goes back to Citizens United. I believe there's a resolution on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the environmental movement is very uh, sensitive to elections, All right. obviously. All right. John Christensen with the West Virginia Environmental Council. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And happy Valentine's Day again. Thank you. And here's a look at some of the bills introduced in the House today and what's coming up in the House tomorrow. Among the bills introduced in the House today, House Bill 4516, to allow for greater cooperation concerning reports of abuse or neglect of vulnerable adults among different entities. The bill also allows the release of information to the perpetrator of the abuse consistent with due process. House Bill 4520, to allow a family court judge to order a child to be taken into custody in emergency situations which occur in the presence of the judge. House Bill 4526, to eliminate straight ticket voting as an option on election ballots. 
House Bill 4528 to tax utility terrain vehicles. The bill makes an exception for vehicles used for agricultural purposes. And House Bill 4529 adding one West Virginia accredited race per day at each thoroughbred track. Among the bills up for passage in the House tomorrow, House Bill 4104 to authorize professional licensing boards to exempt persons who have been continuously licensed for 20 years or more from continuing education requirements. House Bill 4345 to prohibit the unauthorized sale of railroad scrap metal. And House Bill 4390 to create the Uniform Power of Attorney Act and to repeal the Uniform Durable Power of Attorney Act. And this has been the Legislature Today. I'm Beth Voorhees. Thanks for joining us. Good night.